Just a technical glitch, folks. Yeah, this one died out for some reason. This one's working. Proceed. Okay, now we're on. Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, that's right. So, uh, and for the non-Christian, pray that, you know, God might be stirring them up to think about spiritual things and that they're not going to live forever as none of us are. And God is, as I've said before, more concerned about your spiritual health and salvation than he is about you being healed in the body. That doesn't mean he doesn't want you to be well but he wants you to be saved. That's the bottom line, and that's why Jesus came. So just remember that. Pray. Thanks, Jimmy, for the song. We're going to start in John chapter 4 this morning and talk about worship. Worship is part of believing in God or a God. And uh, if you're familiar, again, with history and religions of the world, that every, every religion worships. We even see uh, part of the pagan worship in the New Testament, uh, the God, or even in the Old Testament as well. Israel kept being drawn away to the Baal worship and Moloch and some others. Uh, in the New Testament, we recall the, the uh, encounter in Ephesus the Christians had, the greatest Diana of the Ephesians, and they uh, were... Uh, praising their goddess, and uh, the riot developed over all of that. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans had their pantheons of gods. They had their temples. They had their priests. They had their priestesses and so forth. We know that Israel had a worship that was given to them by God at Mount Sinai, uh, beginning there with the tabernacle, and we're going to be doing some comparing this morning with this. The tabernacle there. Aaronic priesthood, the sacrifices, and all the rituals, and the feast days, and all that, all to worship God in the way that he prescribed. And uh, we, of course, Christians today, we worship according to the ways of the New Testament has been given to us uh, in, uh, when we come together collectively. But I'm not going to talk about that this morning. Often when we talk about worship, we talk about, uh, if you will, we call the avenues, you know, singing, prayer, Lord's Supper. That's not going to be our focus this morning. We're going to look at something a little bit different that kind of underlays all of that and is a foundation for the worship that Jesus wants us to have, to be able to worship in his way. So let's go to John 4, and this is where we'll get our initial thoughts here. Uh, Jesus was passing through uh, Samaria, and he sat down there at the well. Many of you remember this story, and he was thirsty, and he wanted to get a drink of water. Now, just a note on the Samaritans, for those of you who may not be familiar with them. They were a group of people who, who were uh, living in Samaria at the time of Christ, and their uh, forefathers, Roots came from when the uh, Israelites were taken into captivity and they went to Babylon. And there were some of the people that were left behind, some Jews, some very poor Jews. And then uh, the Babylonians resettled some other people in Canaan. And these Jews who were left behind intermarried with these folks who were resettled, and so they were not full-blooded Jews, all right? They did not have a full-blooded ancestry. Well, when the Jews returned from captivity, there became this tension between the two groups because the full-blooded Jews who had gone into captivity and came back did not want to accept these Samaritans who were half-breeds, half if you will. And so this tension developed, uh, and they were... they. The Samaritans were not allowed to go to the temple in Jerusalem, and they developed their own worship there around Samaria at a mountain called Gerizim. So that's a little foundation here, and you'll see this developed as we go to verse 15 in chapter 4. 
And Jesus has asked this woman of Samaria there at the well for a drink. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He has talked to her about living water, and if someone drinks water, that water, they will never die. And she says, oh, wow, I'd like to have that water. We know Jesus in another place you know, talked about, come to me, all you thirsty, and so forth. Verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, that's the one we mentioned, Gerizim. You people say, meaning the Jews, that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And obviously he's speaking about himself because he was a Jew and that was the prophecy made and promise made to Abraham and you and your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And he was the one that seed sitting right in front of her at that very moment. Salvation was of the Jews and is of the Jews through Christ Jesus. 23, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. You noted the disagreement they had there about where to worship. Mount Gerizim, there the mountain around Samaria, or in Jerusalem at the temple. Jesus, in a sense, chooses not to take sides in this dispute. As, we, uh, as we've often called them, worship wars, about how do you worship God. And uh, Many of you have read books and heard sermons and so forth about how to worship. Uh, there's the, the old uh, disagreement about communion cups. Is it one cup? Or are you allowed to have many cups? Uh, should uh, the Lord's Supper be only on the Lord's Day or any day when you want to do it? Should it be on every Lord's Day or just some Lord's Day? You know, there's that discussion. Should we have praise teams or not? Some people have gone so far as to say, well, you should just use one translation of the Bible. We used to, we used to run into this a lot over at the prison. And wherever people get the idea that the King James Version is the one that's actually authorized by God, we would hear that a lot. Of course, it's not true, but we would hear that. So, you know, we have all these discussions, and there was discussions then about worship. But Jesus says it's not about a place, but about what? An attitude of heart, a, a spiritual approach to God. True worshipers, true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. In spirit, I think, means from the inner person, from the soul. It's sincere and it's genuine. And truth, you do what God says to do, uh, as written in his word, in spirit and truth. I want, I want to point this out, and I've looked at every translation, not every, but numerous translations. There is no in before truth. So many times we pray and say, help us worship in spirit and in truth. It doesn't say that. It says in spirit and truth. And I think that means the Holy Spirit meant that is one thing. You can't worship in spirit, but not in truth. And you can't worship in truth, but not in spirit. You, half of it doesn't work. It has to be both. In spirit, from the heart, 
worshiping the correct way in spirit and truth. Just a little aside there. So we're going to pick up on this idea it's not a place. This foundation that underlays our worship when, when we come together, but not only when we come together, as we're going to see. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, keeping that in mind about in spirit and truth, and going to the idea that worship is not to be done or not necessary to be done in a specific place. Under Moses, there was the tabernacle, and that's what they had in the wilderness and when they traveled, and it was a, a portable tent. We had the tents that we put up down at the Loop Festival. Well, they had this very beautiful arrangement where there was the holy place and the most holy and so forth, and where the high priest was. They brought their sacrifices. And then later on, when they went into the, uh, the promised land in Jerusalem, the temple was built. Solomon built the temple. And it served the same purpose. And when they needed to offer sacrifices, they had certain feast days and so forth, they were supposed to go to the temple to worship, to offer these sacrifices. However, under Jesus, the arrangement is different. In 1 Corinthians 3, let's look at verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. Here in this passage, he is referring to, in particular, the collective congregation of the Corinthians. They were a group at that time that were divided. They had cliques. They were... Uh, not having the correct fellowship. They weren't loving one another the way they should. They were a divided group. And so this is why he talks about destroying the temple of God. When you work to divide a congregation, you are destroying the temple of God because you are the temple. We are the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We do not need to go to a temple, a cathedral, or even a church building to worship. We read uh, a couple of different places in the New Testament about the church in people's homes. It's not about a place. You know, we, we get a feeling like this building is holy. And I think that's because we do holy things here. But it's not a holy structure. This is not the place that we have to worship. We could go down to the riverside. We could worship down at the community center. We could go up to Mike and Pat's on the hill and worship. We don't have to be here. But we do need to gather together. We are the temple of God. And that's a beautiful thing. And if you think about it, even as Matt said in his prayer, people that are under persecution in other countries, they can't, they can't assemble in a place. They can't have a place. They have to worship in secret because of their fear for their lives. And so, you know, God was anticipating this when he took away this requirement of coming to a place to worship that people can worship wherever they can get together as a body. That's just God's wisdom. Let's turn over to chapter 6, but there's another aspect to this worship. This is another beautiful thing about worshiping Jesus' way is superior to other ways and is superior to uh, that which was established for the Jews. For the Israelites. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, a kind of a different discussion here when Paul is talking about keeping oneself pure and not sinning, in particular about 
uh, fornication and sexual immorality, which he says in 18, flee immorality. Verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple? Now here he's talking about individuals, not a collective body of Christ in an assembled place, but your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, you see. So wherever we go, we know the Holy Spirit is in us. And we're to glorify God in our body. That, that's worship, you see. That's worship. Glorify God in our body and what we do. We keep, keep ourselves pure. We do good deeds. We speak the truth. We love others. We forgive we're helpful. So Jesus' picture here of worship, worshiping in spirit and in truth, involves the inner person. It involves, involves the Holy Spirit. It involves us when we're together and in, we are a part of, we have the temple of God. We are the temple of God within ourselves. The Holy Spirit is in us. Second thought, let's go to Hebrews 7. We're talking about we don't worship in a place. We are the place, collectively, individually. The priesthood, under Aaron, or I'm sorry, under Moses, the priesthood was un to be in the family of Aaron. Aaron was given the right by God to be the high priest, and from his family, his descendants, all the priests in Israel were descendants that were legitimate. And they were the ones to minister at the temple to offer the sacrifices and so forth and so on. Hebrews chapter 7.23. The former priests, meaning those under the priesthood of Aaron, under Moses, on the one hand existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. Obviously, they died just like any other person. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Jesus came back from the dead. He's living at the right hand of the Father there, reigning, but he's also a priest in his kingdom. He is our high priest now. And he offered his blood to the Father on our behalf. 25, therefore he, meaning Christ, is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He'll never die, so his blood is perpetual and his priesthood is perpetual so he can save us, if you will, forever. That's how we can have immortality, through him. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, Innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. All those true of Christ Jesus. Who does not need daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices. And they, they minister daily with sacrifices, as it says. First for his own sins, because the priests themselves were sinners, and they had to offer sacrifices for themselves. And then for the sins of the people. Because he did once for all when he offered up himself. One time, Jesus offered himself on the cross for the sins of the world. There's no more sacrifice for sins. He did it once for all, it's effective forever. We read earlier, or, yeah, in the book of Hebrews, don't forget whether it's earlier or later from this reading. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. We recall that under Moses. But the blood of Christ does, and he only had to do it one time because he was perfect, the Lamb of God. 28, for the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. That's found in Psalm 110 if you want to go there and read it. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. 
Now, let's go to 1 Peter 2. There was a high priest under Moses, which was Aaron, and then that was passed down in his family. We have one high priest, Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, who are the other priests under Jesus' way of worship? Let's listen to Peter in 1 Peter 2, verse 4. And coming to him, meaning Christ, as a living stone, we, we talked a little bit about this last week when we talked about the kingdom that can't be shaken. A living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, meaning Christians, are being built up a spiritual house, living spiritual house, for a holy priesthood. That's you. That's me. We don't talk about that very much today, but we should. That we are a holy priesthood. But let's keep reading. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's our high priest, mediator, and so forth. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Now listen to this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, we could dwell on that for a long time, and we need to really ponder the place, the position, the honor that we have been given in Christ Jesus. A chosen race, royal priesthood, spiritual house, living stone. You know, the holy priesthood is a reference to the idea that we are separate from the world, sacred, separated unto God for his service. The royal priesthood is the idea, we remember in uh, Revelation chapter 1, it talks about Jesus making us a kingdom and priest. We are part of the royal family, right? Adopted sons into the family of Christ. Christ is the king, and we are in his family, you see? So we are part of the royal family of Christ Jesus. And we are destined to receive an inheritance along with him. You know, the, these things are not just words on a page. That, th this is reality. This is the promise of God who cannot lie that he is going to give to us in the hereafter. And these are the things we need to focus on from time to time, especially when things are going bad, especially, especially when there's a struggle, when, when we are sick or th th things aren't right. We have a future. It might, it might not be what we want here, but we have a future there that is beyond comprehension. But we are now a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood unto God, offering up these spiritual sacrifices through Christ Jesus, our high priest. Now let's look. Let's go to Romans 12. We're talking about those spiritual sacrifices, not animals. You, you can read all about that in, in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all these various sacrifices that were needed in certain situations, whether it was a, a bull, a goat, a lamb, maybe a turtle dove or whatever. 
We don't offer those kind of sacrifices now, but we do offer sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices. The first one we want to see here in Romans 12, 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, we already talked about our bodies being the temple of God, temple of the Holy Spirit, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Some translations say reasonable service. But it's a sacrifice that's offered to God when we offer God our bodies, the use of our bodies in his service. That's a spiritual sacrifice as a priest to God. Whatever he might call us to do, to be, to help a neighbor, to forgive someone, to provide food, clothing, shelter, to bring them the gospel, to present our bodies. We are servants of God, right? Is not Jesus our master? Is he our shepherd leading us? But what a great honor that we can offer spiritual sacrifices, offer ourselves to God. And then we go back to Hebrews chapter 13. More specifically, the, the writer here talks about spiritual sacrifices in verse 15. Through him then, meaning Christ Jesus, our high priest, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. We'll stop there. Praise to God. We've been praising God this morning in song. That again is to be from the heart, not just the lips. Praise to God through song. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as we, we read and study a lot. Some of you uh, sing at home, don't you? Do I dare ask how many of you sing at home from time to time? Yes, you do. That's worship. You are moved to praise God in your house or wherever you are. That's worship from the heart. But it isn't just simple. Any time we honor God or speak a word for God, it's worship. Like when you tell someone, they say, well, how you been? Well, I've been, I've been well. God has blessed me. God has given me a healing. That's a sacrifice of praise to God. You've pointed people to God and you've given him the praise. You've given him the glory. You've given him the honor for what he's done in your life. God has helped me find a job. God has helped, helped me with my marriage and, and my wife and I are doing much better now. We need to be saying those kinds of things and giving him the honor that is due him for blessing us in so many ways. That's a sacrifice of praise to God. And it says we should be doing that continually, not, not taking the credit ourselves, not just giving the doctor and the medical community the credit, although they deserve a lot, and we're thankful that they bless us. But God is the great healer. He's behind it all, and we need to give him the praise for it. Verse 16, though, do not neglect, neglect, I'm sorry, do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. You see? Another kind of sacrifice, to do good to other people, to share what you have. Somebody in need, that is a sacrifice to God and gives him the glory. And we read, not I just said what, what we do, we should do in Jesus' name, right? So we give him the glory that way. God has blessed me so I can bless you, you know. This is a gift from Jesus because I serve him. It's so easy to say, but sometimes we don't. And I don't know why we're afraid to say that. We need to be, as priests to God, giving him the praise, giving him the glory, and offering these wonderful sacrifices to his name. So this is what we wanted to mention this morning about worship Jesus' way. It's not about a place, but about 
the fact that we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. It's about an attitude and a spiritual approach to God that we are, in fact, priests unto God under our high priest Jesus. And we're to be continually offering the sacrifice of praise and good works to him. So we give ourselves as living sacrifices for Jesus, who in fact gave himself for us on the cross. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning.